Hello, and welcome to the United Nations 17 Days of Sustainability, led by IdeaGen Global. My name is Kim Smith, and I'm Global Vice President of Hybrid Cloud Services and on the UNCTAD board for advisory around the sustainable development goals working with IdeaGen. Today, I'm joined by several of our IBM executives to talk about technology for good and collaborative innovation in support of the sustainable development goals. What I'd like to do is offer each executive the chance to share with you a little bit about their background and experience and what they're working on today in their role and responsibility at IBM. Justina, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Kim. So hi, everyone. My name is Justina nixon St. Hill, and I lead the corporate social responsibility function at IBM. This means I drive strategic investments that leverages IBM's technology and talent to address some of the world's biggest societal challenges especially in education and sustainability. I've been leading this work for the last nine months. And prior to coming to IBM, I was at Verizon, where I was leading initiatives focused on eliminating the digital divide in high poverty communities. Thank you. That was fantastic, Justina. Christina, can we turn it over to you now? Sure. Um, I'm Christina Montgomery. I'm the Chief Privacy Officer for IBM. Um, and also the co-chair of the AI Ethics Board. Uh, I've been an IBM attorney, although I'm not currently acting as an attorney for the company in my role as chief privacy officer. I've been an attorney for IBM for the last, for more than 20 years now. I spent five years as the corporate secretary to the board of directors, and I spent a lot of time during those five years, obviously hearing from the board, hearing from investors on what matters, particularly in and with respect to um, environmental, social, and governance matters. Um, and when I came into the role as chief privacy officer, I was tasked with essentially scaling our privacy operations and also formalizing governance around both the AI ethics board and privacy for the company. Um, I spent a good deal of time now focused on ensuring the data and technologies that we deploy realize their promise without compromising the trust that we've earned as a company for more than 100 years now. Thank you, Christina. Rosalind, can you share a little bit about your background and your role at IBM? Sure, thank you. First, as a former Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia who administered polio shots in the mouth of young ones and protected water sources from cholera, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about how working collectively, businesses, governments, healthcare workers, technologists, we all can make a positive impact at the local and global levels. At IBM, I'm the Vice President of Technology and Science Policy. I lead an amazing team to advance IBM's public policy and business objectives in such areas as AI, cloud, data, 5G, privacy, and quantum. I also serve as the co-chair of the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council on Agile Governance. And I help to establish the IBM Policy Lab to which Angelica and Christina have contributed, and I'm excited to share more about that in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalyn. Angelica, let's hear a little bit about your background and your experience as well. Sure, thank you. So um, I'm Angelica Dorch. I am an IBM technology policy executive within our government and regulatory affairs team. Um, I'm responsible for leading the development and advocacy for IBM's global policy priorities to include responsible AI, intellectual property, and inclusive technologies. Um, prior to joining IBM, I spent 10 years as a civil servant in the US government working on tech policy initiatives at various agencies, including the White House. And it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about um, good tech policies that I work on. Thank you, Angelica. Saska, uh, you are our final executive for this panel. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and experience for the audience. Hey everyone, my name is Sashka Muisilovic and I'm an IBM fellow and a scientist and I've been working on this uh, intersection of data-driven decision-making and mathematical modeling and machine learning and AI for probably over 25 years now. I joined IBM 22 years ago. Before that, I was with Bell Labs and I was always fascinated with these applications of, of hey, how do how do we teach computers to to make something out of this world and 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 make this world a better place? And today at IBM, I lead the foundations of trustworthy AI organization 
in our global trustworthy AI strategy. So, so we are basically a bunch of technologies and scientists who are um, trying to understand how do we create safer, more responsible and beneficial AI deployments, things like algorithmic fairness, and also lead our Science for Social Good program, where we team up with organizations around the world to create new technologies that would help with the most pressing problems of our planet. I am blown away and so humbled to be here with each of you today, given all the amazing work that you're leading. I'd like to start our conversation around technology for good, some of the challenges and best practices that you've seen. Justina, what are some of the challenges in our industry based on your role and expertise? And what are some of the ways that you're working to solve some of those challenges today? Yeah, absolutely. So there are just many challenges right now in our industry around education and workforce development. However, the technology skills gap and the lack of diversity in the technology field are the two that I focus on the most. So we all know that attaining the right education and skills leads to meaningful employment and decreases economic inequality. And the pandemic, the pandemic has actually brought awareness to the fact that there is a glaring global skills gap, especially for those who have been historically excluded from the technology workforce, such as women, black and brown communities in the US, and also marginalized populations globally. So companies in all industries really need to lean in and take advantage of this untapped talent pool to be successful. What IBM has done over the last few years has really been around investing to close the skills gap by providing access to free resources for career readiness. We have a skills build program that provides a thousand courses, especially in tech disciplines. And we provide this for job seekers and also students to provide exposure to those tech fields. And just, just this year, we had around 500,000 people who access our content on our skills build platform. Other programs that align very closely to the SDG goals include our STEM for Girls program in India, where we've reached 140,000 girls and provided training on digital literacy and coding as in addition to career coaching. And then we have our P-Tech program in its 10th year, where we provide a free education, free high school or secondary school diploma and free associate's degree, especially to under-resourced and disadvantaged youth. So this is something that IBM has invested in for a very long time. And this is a way that we are making sure that we help to close the skills gap. That's fantastic, Justina. Thank you for sharing that. I'm not sure everyone knows all of the things that we're doing in scaling up the next generation of workforce. It's really important that they have the opportunity to hear some of those numbers. Christina, let's talk about privacy and ethics and, and data and AI. And what are you seeing as some of the challenges in your current role? And how are you focused on solving them on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, so yeah, my focus is on the responsible use of data and technologies. Um, there are a couple of key areas where we're seeing challenges today. The first is really with respect to the rapid development of new technologies that are being created and put into use so quickly that there's a sense, a growing sense that regulation can't keep up. Um, that leaves it to companies to impose their own guardrails on these new technologies like AI and neurotechnology. Um, this coupled with the explosion of consumer data collection and oftentimes a lack of transparency around that collection have a risk of eroding consumer trust around tech. So we believe it's essential that we lay a foundation today that ensures new technologies put people first and that their benefits are felt broadly across society. So at IBM, we align ourselves to what we call the principles for trust and transparency. At a high level, these are AI should augment, not replace human intelligence, the data and insights from that data belong to their creator, in our case, that's our clients, and that new technologies, including AI, should be deployed transparently uh, and explain in, with transparency and explainability. Um, so we impose firm guardrails on our own use of technology and data, and we advocate for others to do the same through concrete, actionable policy recommendations. And uh, my colleague, Roz Doctor, will cover that in a little bit more detail as part of this panel. 
Um, we believe that responsible stewardship of new technologies is key, especially AI, right? Because these new technologies are at the heart of innovations that can provide solutions to many um, of the sustainable development goals and in support of those goals. However, if society doesn't trust the technology, we won't see these innovations as quickly as we could or their effectiveness might be hindered. So what I'm doing here is working to create an environment uh, of trust for our clients so that innovation won't be hindered. Outstanding, and that's profound because of the fact that everything we touch has data connected to it. Yeah. And at any level, um, there's a challenge to be addressed around not only the ethics of that data, but um, specifically how that data can be used for good as well. Roslyn, uh, I know that you've got a new role and love to learn a little bit more about some of the things that you're doing to advance the cause around policy as it relates to how we can collaborate more and drive tech for good. Sure. And you also talked about challenges. And I wanted to state the obvious, but it's important that challenges don't need a passport or a proof of vaccination status to cross borders. Pandemics, climate change, semiconductor shortages are all global. And solution to these need to address the problems via a global lens with local impact understood. And that's why I'm thrilled to lead the public policy on science and technology, because public policy has a key role to play here if it's informed by diverse, diverse stakeholders from lawmakers, academia, government, civil society that have that understanding of a global lens and local impact knowledge. Further, we need strong international coordination around policy, like the convening power of the UN. All of this will really help drive pragmatic policies that make a difference. And data like challenges doesn't stop flowing at national borders. So we need laws to enable the free flow of data, equitable, equitable development and use of AI, like Christina talked about and we'll hear more about, and the enablement of cloud technology diffusion as it is this data on these platforms with the AI tooling built in that scientists, researchers, and entrepreneurs need to solve these global challenges. Yet as we see more technological convergence like the AI cloud and data, we're challenged with growing fragmentation, inconsistencies, and duplications on policies, whether it's AI or data within and across countries. For example, in the United States, 29 states have drafted privacy laws with not alignment in, with the US federal lack of a policy. In India, there's also inconsistencies at the central state level, among others. Canada, we're seeing different federal and province actions around data and privacy. So this lack of coherence is a challenge to innovation and the benefits that technologies like AI could deliver. And I can't wait to hear more from Saska on that. And IBM has responded to this challenge with our policy lab. This is a new forum that convenes leading thinkers in public policy, in academia, in technology to develop common sense policies that accelerates innovation while ensuring trust, looking globally and understanding local impacts. Outstanding. And the policy lab is really a, a great way, and we'll talk a little bit more about collaborative innovation here shortly, but a really great way for many other organizations to engage with IBM around collaboration and innovation to support not only policy, but again, tech for good. So Angelica, let's share a little bit more about your experience and some of the things that you're focused on on a day-to-day -day basis today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for me, um, I, in my role, I'm working on definitely advancing our policy priorities, especially with the use of um, AI. Um, recently, um, we released a point of view within our policy lab on mitigating AI bias. And I think, you know, to the earlier question in terms of, you know, what are some of the challenges we see in our industry? I think uh, some of that is collaboration and consensus building within the tech sector, because sometimes we're such com fierce competitors, we don't want to lay our swords down to figure out how we can address these issues. Um, but what's interesting, I think we're all seeing this commonality of um, bias in AI. We will never eliminate this, but there are strategies we can um, develop. So with the release of IBM's uh, point perspective, um, mitigating um, strategies to mitigate AI bias, we came out with five um, policy imperatives 
um, including addressing um, and increasing AI literacy, um, making sure that testing and impact assessments are done, and different um, making sure that uh, there's responsible licensing um, elements in when we're deploying AI um, are some of those strategies that we are working with policymakers to not only educate, but also try to infuse and incorporate and in global policies moving forward. And I think what's great is with, you know, in terms of the, the collaboration and coalition building, um, certain companies are definitely coming to the table as we've led in the discussion of these topics to say, hey, um, this is a good idea. We do agree with this. Um, and so we are getting more folks to the table. And I think it's it's really important um, as we keep moving in this space, especially on um, mitigating bias in AI, that we bring others along and also do more to educate our um, leader or global leaders on the importance of this issue. You raise a really good point around not just education, but adoption and the transfer of that knowledge throughout government agencies, corporations, and individuals, because the more we take that information and carry it forward, the more others understand how they have the ab ability to actually change you know, where things are today. So I think that's really profound. Saska, let's hear a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing with the foundation and um, learn specifically some of the connections back to the sustainable development goals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so I think what's really interesting is if, if you look at the issues that our planet is facing, things like emerging diseases, climate, uh, hunger, inequalities, they all in some way, shape or form call for new scientific discoveries or technological transformation. So, so in our lab and, and, and in our program and in our research, we actually use these problems of the world and we use these challenges to inspire and inform our scientific thinking. So let me give you a couple of examples. So one of the major areas investment in investment areas for us today is what we call AI powered molecular discovery. So for example, if you want to fight emerging diseases like COVID, we need new therapies. We need new fertilizers to grow more food by consuming less energy. We need the materials for carbon capture. We need green semiconductors. And a lot of our work focuses on how can we use AI to actually discover these new materials automatically? How can we use AI to power up such discoveries? Uh, so for example, in, in one very fascinating project, we recently demonstrated a first antibiotic that was entirely created by AI. You know, think of, others using AI to create speech or, or, or images or things like that. But imagine what we can do if we can create molecular goodness. Um, new antibiotics, new photoresists, you name it. Um, another massive area of investment, and, and Angelica and Christina and Ross talked about it, is this notion of including AI. Today in, in our society, data-driven decision-making and algorithmic-driven decision-making touch on, on so many things, on, on, on how we allocate resources and, and make decisions in healthcare and social services and care management, uh, infrastructure deployments, right? And we need to make sure that those decisions are truly inclusive and take everyone into account. So over the last couple of years, we've created several leading software libraries and packages that enable real practical implementations of, of more inclusive and, and less biased AI technologies and models, libraries such as AI Fairness 360, AI Explainability 360, uh, uncertainty quantification, and we've been incorporating those capabilities into IBM products and services. Another line of work is natural language because we want to be able to have better access to knowledge and better uh, read and understand what's in the documents that this society has compiled for centuries, right? So that we can find evidence for things like drug repurposing, new therapies, new materials. So it's it's really going to change and accelerate how we solve problems. So, so I think as a summary, when we look at the AI research today, AI is such a hot topic. There are so many organizations, so many companies making tremendous investment in it. But I think what is really critical and what we've been doing in our lab is to truly direct AI research 
towards the problems of this planet and where it's very badly needed so that we can move the needle on these pressing issues. I think that context is helpful, Saskia. And as we move to the next uh, conversation that we want to drive here for this discussion, it leads me to ask you a question about collaborative innovation. There were two areas around AI that you touched on, discoverability and inclusivity. And when you think about those two areas, there's tremendous opportunity to collaborate, whether it be through new supply chains or through inclusivity across multiple types of organizations, multiple groups of individuals. How do you look at collaborative innovation as it relates to some of the best practices that you're implementing? I, I, I think this is fundamentally going to be the, the new way of how we make things, how we innovate, how we create, how we discover. Um, I talk a lot about the need for new innovations, but they're not going to be made by one person or one team or even one company, right? They, we are going to make them together and in some way, shape or form, we are going to be aided by these new technologies such as artificial intelligence and, and, and cloud. And I think, I think in a way COVID pandemic was, was one example, because if you look back in the last two years, uh, we've never seen a, a, so many of the world's resources come together and, and focus so urgently on a single topic. We've seen people work together across organizational boundaries, across geo boundaries. Um, and uh, I can give an example. So our work in accelerated discovery, we applied our, our um, AI technologies and created um, 3000 molecular candidates for COVID drugs. And what we did, unlike before, we fully opened, released those molecules uh, in uh, the open license and we deployed them on the cloud in a very interesting interactive tool called Molecular Explorer that would allow everyone to touch them, to use them, to repurpose them, to simulate them, to study them, so that we can accelerate how we create new drugs from 10 years to maybe two years. And we had so many research labs and pharma companies and um, uh, testing labs take over these molecules and then simulate them and then test them in an effort to create these new therapeuticals. Uh, we've created high performance computing consortium so that we can unleash the power of most powerful computers in the world to the research teams around the world who most who need that those capabilities the most. So I think if we look at the last two years, they were really bad in one way, right? A terrible pandemic. But there was a silver lining be because it showed us uh, these new open mechanisms for collaboration. And I think what we need to do now is to actually really keep this momentum and apply these new models to so many other issues of our planet that need our attention. You know, the, the examples that you've just given, Saskia, focused on the um, collaboration in a way that had a laser-centric, prioritized way of advancing that cause is key. If I talk to Angelica, when you think about public policy, what are some of the best practices around collaborative innovation? And, and is laser focus one of them? You know, what, what are some areas that you think really drive forward collaborative innovation um, for some of the challenges that you shared with us today? Yeah, um, I think to, for me, it's really engaging our policymakers early and often. I think that's key in addressing some of these challenges. Um, I also think coalition building um, is an important aspect to that. Um, at IBM, we collaborate with many external partners and our competitors to advance good tech policies. Um, we've been doing this for years and we will continue to do this. Um, and I think we, when, um, we, uh, excuse me, I, I think as the geopolitical landscape continues to change, um, that also means that there's a wide spectrum of understanding of technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum, and hybrid cloud. And so it's incumbent upon us, the makers and innovators, to educate uh, both the new next generation of policymakers and the current ones 
on not only what that the power and the positivity of these technologies, but help us expand its adoption so it can help change and accelerate discovery um, across the globe. I think there's many um, positive things that can happen um, when we're able to engage policymakers and educate them and kind of these lights go off to just see not only is this about the economy, but it's about our workforce. Um, it's about making sure that uh, other there are other economic opportunities globally and really just, I think overall, just creating this positive and, and advancement for society as a whole. Right, so that inclusivity becomes really critical in your space. Roz, what about um, when you think about policy labs, our understanding is part of the success of policy lab is truly collaborative innovation. Um, what are some best practices that, that you're seeing get implemented through some of the initiatives that you're driving? Sure, thank you. And this conversation is similar to what we do at the policy lab. This, is, this conversation has convened leaders in different disciplines, people with different depths of experience and brought them together to have a collaboration so that we can all learn from each other. And that's the essence of what we're trying to do with the policy lab, to lead collaborations, as Angelica explained, to educate, which is so important, right? And it's educating the lawmakers, as she said, and companies as well as others. And these collaborations that the policy lab leads, sometimes it's just you know, IBM uh, inviting folks to the table. Other times we partner with governments. We partnered with, for example, the Singapore government around AI regulation as they were developing their AI governance framework. And we've had a conversation with those stakeholders that were building that with the government to help the government get feedback in ways they might not have been able to get feedback without having an external convener and a trusted source on responsible technology drive that conversation. We've had conversations around transatlantic, transatlantic relationships and around digital trade. As I said, as we convene on these, these topics, we wanna to find common sense policy solutions that accelerates and enables innovation uh, that, that Saska spoke about, but we need to solve global challenges, right? That convening for convening sake or bringing these folks together is we need to have what is the outcome, what is the impact that these dialogues will create. Uh, we, we've had many examples in the AI field, so if I can give you one example of what we've achieved from these conversation, and I wanna talk about open technologies and what we've done there and with 5G. The Policy Lab convened and produced a paper on, on the adoption of open technologies and interoperable solutions, the ability for technologies to interoperate and to enable substitutability of technology in 5G. And we talked about how it can create innovation, it can spur competition, and it can expand the supply chain and the security of the supply chain for advanced wireless technologies. Through this effort and IBM's dialogue, Dialogues, we've helped launch a new global collaboration around promoting open, secure 5G technologies through public policy. So this new collaboration that we helped find, found, uh, was is called the Open Radio Access Network Policy Coalition. Yes, that's a mouthful. Uh, open RAN Policy Coalition in short. It has 60 members. And as Angelica said, some of these members, you might be listening right now, um, often compete but we come together when we see a common public policy objective. And we're all committed to that international coherence of policy around 5G, open 5G and secure 5G's technologies that we need to see to achieve the sustainable development goals. So much can be achieved through technology if we move the power and access to technology further down the road, right? To what we call edge computing. And we can do this um, more easily, more securely, and more uh, spurring more innovation and more participation if we do it based on open technology and open standards, open software infused cloud technologies. And the policy lab convened this conversation and then saw a coalition of support afterwards. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Christina. And as you think about some of what we've discussed today, which I'm sure you're well aware of, 
it's a delicate balance in your role when you think about collaborative innovation and what that means, whether it's collaboration around the innovation that Ross talked about with the technology or collaboration through you know, partnerships through the policy lab or some of our AI and ethics work. What is your take on, as you think, as our chief privacy officer and head of ethics, how are we thinking about where collaboration and innovation come together and we can have the right guardrails in place to support them? Yeah, so I think um, we obviously can't do it alone. Like these are big issues, right? And big problems to solve. And so part of um, what our initiatives and our work in the AI ethics space is to talk to others to build partnerships. So for example, we're members of the Partnership on AI. We formed a cross-disciplinary, the first really of its kind cross-disciplinary lab at the no University of Notre Dame, a tech ethics lab to have a cross-disciplinary approach and study of AI ethical issues. So partnerships there. Um, and most recently, our chairman uh, is a co-chair of the Global AI Action Alliance that was started by the World Economic Forum. And as part of that alliance, we've basically committed to share and we've been sharing uh, our approach to AI ethics, the concrete steps that we take as a company, sharing it with others. And we're hoping that that will help guide best practices in the space as well. That's really helpful. And it gives good guidance for how we're thinking about the longer term lifetime legacy that comes with the responsibility of making this information available, making these this new IP, this new technology, these new capabilities available so that others can build upon it as well. And Justina, what are your thoughts for collaborative innovation? I know there are some other initiatives that you're working on specifically to support this. We'd love to hear more. Yeah, absolutely. So my colleagues have shared a lot around public-private partnerships, coalitions. These are all key. There is um, nothing that we can solve, right, with just one company. We need these partnerships. We need to work with others to have the greatest impact, especially when, um, you know, we want to use our technology for good. Um, when I look at the partnerships that have helped us so far, when we look at our P-Tech program, we have 600 industry partners. These are clients and companies globally that are providing workplace opportunities, internships, job opportunities to the students that are graduating out of the program. When we look at our, our program called Skills Build with our course load and our, um, our training that we provide, we've partnered with companies like Manpower and other um, clients globally to provide that pathway into a meaningful job. You know, just this year, we have provided 5,000 of our participants um, opportunities at new, better paying jobs. So partnerships with companies, they're key. Partnerships with uh, state governments, with districts, with ministries of education, those are all key as well to be successful. And then when you look at the work that we're doing in sustainability, we have very successful programs that we've launched with companies like the Linux Foundation for our Call for Code program. And we are working with developers, open source software developers who are creating software to help mitigate the effects of climate change. So this is software that is already being used by farmers in Mongolia for better weather forecasting. So again, it's really important to work with nonprofit organizations, with state governments, with clients and other corporations to really make a difference um, in society. It's a really powerful point. Think about that farmers, in addition to technologists, are actually advancing the cause of what they're trying to achieve to make the world a better place. And um, it, it reminds me that sometimes others forget that uh, IBM actually uh, oversees the Weather Channel as well, uh, which I know each of us probably use on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you think about every one of the sustainable goals is impacted by truly by, by weather. Um, with that, I'm going to close with, with one final question, and it's a two-part question. Justina, we'll start with you. The first is, what guidance do you have for leaders who are embarking on this journey in their own ways with their own roles? Um, what, are, what is your guidance for how, how to really 
advance the cause to accelerate their efforts around tech using technology for good in support of the sustainable development goals? That's my first part of the question. The second is, what is one thing that you'll be doing to change the world? Yeah, absolutely. So I think what um, what I would the advice I would provide to leaders is be open to new ideas, be open to innovation and trying new things. Um, you know, the societal challenges are huge and they they you know, the pandemic has exacerbated many of them. And we need to figure out how do we solve for these challenges across the board globally, right? Again, with partnerships, with new innovations, with technology. So I think being able to look at opportunities that are available um, where we can use technology for good, where we can create those right partnerships, I think that's how we're gonna come together and solve those um, big challenges. And then your second question, I, you know, as a young mechanical engineer, um, my goal was always to improve our communities. And I'm in a position now where I'm able to do this with an amazing team every day. So um, I just love the work that I do and I love being able to drive societal impact. And one of the things that I always do on a personal level is mentor many young women, as many women as I could meet both in my family, in schools, um, you know, at work, um, because, you know, my belief is if we can support and empower women, we can definitely change the world. Powerful. Thank you so much. Christina, how about you? What is your what is your guidance for leaders who are embarking on this journey? And what is uh, the one thing that you're doing to change the world? Yeah, so I, I spoke earlier about IBM's principles of trust and transparency. And I, I think that the thing I would keep in mind um, is really the trick is in operationalizing those. Like it's not enough to just have principles. You have to really infuse them into your practices across the company. And that's what we're doing through the AI Ethics Board and a number of the initiatives that the board is driving, both from a tops down and a bottoms up approach. Um, and it's also a mechanism by which we hold ourselves and all IBMers accountable to those values and principles, right? And then the other thing I would say is no company can do this alone, as I mentioned. So we advocate, as we've shared with you today, for policies that are consistent with those principles across the board. And we've been very public in uh, our position, for example, to firmly oppose the use of technologies, including facial recognition, for mass surveillance, racial profiling, and violations of basic human rights and, or freedoms, really for any purpose that's inconsistent with those principles of trust and transparency that I spoke about earlier. And we were the first major tech company to do that, to announce that we would no longer offer general purpose facial recognition software products. Um, and we called for a dialogue on whether and how facial recognition technology should be used by law enforcement. So it's a matter of not only uh, articulating uh, pr principles, but ensuring that your practices align with them and then being very forward uh, leaning and, and uh, clear about what those principles are and how you hold yourself accountable to those. Um, and then, you know, for me, what is one thing I do? I'm in a very fortunate position, as Justina mentioned as well, with respect to her role, um, to essentially support responsible tech. Like, I really do believe that innovative technologies can play a critical role in helping to address many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but in order to do that, uh, we really need to face head on the critical questions that society is asking about responsibility and ethics in technology. And we need to ensure that we're laying a foundation today for uh, AI to be human centered, for it to benefit all of society, not just the elite few. And so, as I said, I think I'm very fortunate to be in a role where I can um, model that for IBM. I can operationalize that for IBM. I can speak externally about it. Um, and, uh, you know, as I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, by being responsible stewards of new technology, uh, and we have been here at IBM for more than 110 years, um, I'm going to continue to work to maintain the highest ethical standards and ensure the company does to put people and their interests ahead, you know, really at the heart of everything we're doing as a company, as we work to build a better and more prosperous future for, for all. Thank you, Christina. Roz, how about you? What is your perspective for leaders embarking on this journey? And what is the one thing that you're doing to truly change the world? So Kim, thank you. I loved that question. And I have to admit, I cheated. I asked my children, what is mom doing to change the world beyond raising you? And they both said, spreading kindness, as be kind is a mantra in my house for my tweens. 
So while kindness is critically needed, especially in middle schoolers these days, I wanted to go back to the concepts of promoting interoperability in our technologies and our policies by thinking globally and understanding local impact. But I wanted to clarify something and add on to what Christina talked about, is but being global in your policies doesn't mean broad and blunt. IBM recommends a precision approach to regulation. So let's look at that law enforcement example that Christina talked about. We do uh, suggest and promote a tailored policy looking at the use case and end user of the technology. So law enforcement use of facial recognition technology should have mandatory disclosures so that we know it's being use, used. But it doesn't mean that we should impede the technology being used for good, such as using facial recognition to find missing persons after a hurricane. And such a policy needs a global lens. So we wanna maybe look at modifying export laws to include oversight of facial recognition technologies and the limitation of some of those. And we need to look at this globally because we need interoperability in our laws and in our coordination so that we collectively as businesses, governments, health workers, technologies can solve these problems. The global interoperability of policy and law is what we need to exchange data to get the right information in the right hands, to have the right tools to solve the problems of today and tomorrow and to make a positive impact both at the global and local level and the policy lab was designed to play that role and i'm hoping it's doing just that and i look forward to working with all of you here my fellow panelists and anyone watching this on our policy lab so thank you so much for this opportunity thank you ross angelica let's hear your perspective what do you think leaders need to be doing as they embark on this journey and what is one thing that you're doing to change the world? Absolutely. So I would say engaging companies like IBM to discuss policy changes that can foster the development of um, technologies for good. I think that's extremely critical. Um, IBM is the oldest tech company in the world and it draws from a rich 110 year history. We've learned from our past to help inform our future, which is why we're one of the most innovative companies in the world. So my plug here would be come talk to us at IBM. Our door is always open. You can talk to any one of these executives on the panel, especially if you're considering proposals or strategies that advance good tech policies, because that's what we believe in and we want to help support that. Um, as with regards to you know what I'm doing to change the world, I would definitely say um, along the lines of what Justine has shared, um, knowledge sharing with the next generation. Um, the kids behind us are, are lethal, and I mean that in the most positive way possible. Um, they are the fastest adopters of technologies, they embrace collaboration, and they have a unique entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. And as Justina mentioned, IBM has partnered with several organizations that allow IBMers like myself to engage and mentor the next generation or who I would call the tech generation. So for me, it's about mentoring, especially for communities that are potentially still early adopters of technology and making sure that they can draw upon my things that I've learned in the past and just our rich history at IBM. Thank you, Angelica. Saskia, as we wrap up our panel, love to hear your perspective on what, what leaders need to be thinking about as they embark on this journey. And again, one area that you are focused on in changing the world. So, so um, thinking is important, but I think listening and, and, and hearing and learning might be to some extent even more important here because we need to create so many new solutions, but sometimes it's hard to create solutions for problems that we don't fully understand. And many of us are really blessed to, to be in positions that we are, and we may not know what it means to be hungry or poor or not access to don't, not have access to medication or, or be discriminated against. So I think being open to the experiences of others and learning from those who are truly on the forefront of these problems is going to be critical. So that was, for example, one of the ways we structured our work in accelerated discovery in science for social good. We partner with organizations who truly 
are on the frontiers of, of these challenges and we ask them the questions, what do you do? How do you work? What are the problems that, that you're facing so that we can learn from them and, and, and get that much needed inspiration for, for our work and, and for our solutions. So I think that listening and learning is, is, is going to be uh, golden here. And when it gets to, to uh, my work and, and how I think it might help to change the world is, well, I would like to use my work to, to tell stories, to, to showcase what's possible, uh, to inspire others, especially the up and coming generation of, of technologies and scientists and researchers and, and policy makers and legislators because we have these really huge problems uh, in front of us for our plan planet and it's going to be a long journey and it's going to take many, many steps and, and we all need it and we all need to pitch in. Thank you, Saskia. Thank you to our IBM executive leadership panel focused on technology for good and collaborative innovation to solve for the sustainable development goals. And from all of us at IBM, special thanks to the United Nations and to Idea Gen Global for this unique opportunity to share insightful perspective from each of these executives and the opportunity to work with us in the future. So thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure to speaking with all of you and I wish you all a great summit. Thank you and take care.